move and walk out of this tomb Buried underneath the lies that you believe Safe and sound, stuck in the ground Too lost to be found You're just asleep And it's time to leave Come on, rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Your brand new power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? The door is open wide and the stone's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has come, so come on and rise up. Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Your brand new power of death couldn't hold you. From the grave like Lazarus Rise up Rise up He's calling us to walk out of the dark He's given us new resurrected hearts He's calling us to walk out of the dark Giving us new resurrected hearts. Come on, rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Your brand new power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? what that's saying, right? Amen. You have uh, been able to say that uh, if you know Christ, you've been risen again, right? Amen. Because you've come from death to life. You have an everlasting home in heaven one day, right? When Jesus comes to get us, uh, that ought to excite you. You don't have to live in defeat. You live in victory. So rise up. Act like it. Amen? Yes, yes. This next song, y'all, uh, we, boy, we want y'all to sing out on this. This is Graves in the Gardens. It's one we all know, and we just want you to sing out to him. We're here for him. I had someone tell me uh, yesterday or ask me, you know, uh, man, what do you think it would be like to the people uh, in church if, if, if Jesus were to walk in today? Right? Well, uh, you may not see him with physical eyes, but he's here. Amen? So let's sing like he's here. Because, again, I've said it before. I will say it again uh, probably more than today. Just to remind you, that is going to be heaven. We're going to be there to worship him every day. So let's, let's practice now. Amen? Y'all worship with us. Search the world, 
Here we go. I searched the But it couldn't feel me. Man's empty prayers and treasures of faith are never enough. But then you came along and you put me back together. Thank you, Lord. And every desire is now satisfied here in your life. Yes. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing.
turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. One more time, you turn graves. You turn graves into bodies. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. After all, our Jesus, right? That's my Jesus. I sure hope he's your Jesus. And that's what this next song is talking about. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Right? Rises up from what? An empty grave. Yes. There's the empty grave, y'all. And he, uh, he saves anybody, right? There's no sinner that he can't save. That's our Jesus. Amen. Y'all seen this one with I'm past the point of where is a burden laying heavy? Is it all too much to care? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that to fear? He shakes down all its steel. You're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is Let me 
Father God, hmm, what true lyrics of that song, Lord. So thankful. God, you're the only, the only person, being, Lord, that can change our lives. And Lord, I pray today that we'll realize that and we'll give you that opportunity to continue to change our lives, to mold our lives to be more like you. And I pray we'll continue to focus on you today as we lift up your name through song and a few moments through the word of God. God, we just want you to be honored and glorified today in all we say and do. In the precious name of Jesus. They bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the throne of God and say, You are worthy of all.
Father God, we do just praise you today because you are the only one worthy of anything that we have to offer. And Lord, I do pray that our words today, what we're singing from our hearts would be just like our prayers are to you, that, that the words that we're saying would be like sweet smelling incense um, for what you're hearing from us today. Genuine hearts wanting only to be focused on you, the only one deserving. We continue to worship you. Lift your name high this morning. May you be glorified in all. In your precious son's name, in the name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen.
I thank you for words of faith. God, I thank you for giving these songs to these people who wrote them down so we could sing them about you and who you are. So, Lord, I pray for those that may have come in today feeling a little hopeless, feeling weary, feeling burdened down, or just plumb give out, God. I pray that they know they're in the right place because they're going to be under your word. And it's in your word where we find hope. It's in your presence, Lord where we find our purpose and our calling. It's where we find our identity. We're, we are not what the world says we are. We are who you say we are. And Lord, because you overcome, we get to overcome. So God, thank you. So I pray as we move forward, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear. ears to hear what you have to say to us today I pray that we are challenged God that we are encouraged that we are taught by you today and we pray this in the name of Jesus the only Savior of the world and everybody says Amen Amen well, good morning, friendship. If you go to John chapter 7 and Galatians 4 at one time, we can call you an advanced Bible flipper. You can put that on your business card. I'm an advanced Bible flipper. Somebody once told me, man, you use too much Scripture. How can you not use Scripture? How can you not be in his word? Amen. <laughs> so while you're turning, let me, let, me, let me give you this verse one more time. So it's in Ecclesiastes. I know I'm giving you three at once, but don't worry about it. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. It says this, and, and we really need to understand this by now, that there's something way bigger going on. That there is a big God, that from Him all are all things, and to Him are all things. He deserves the glory. He is worthy of it all. And His Word says this, church, it says, To everything there is a season. To everything, everything, every single thing there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. In other words, anything that you see, anything that God has created, there's a reason for it. And there's a, what we would call a time stamp for that whole thing. There's a reason, it's not just, it just didn't just happen, right? So there's a season and there's a time for every single thing. I hope that comes alive in you today. So that means just like the earth has fall, hallelujah for fall, we in fall right now, winter, spring, summer, just like it has all of that, our lives have seasons as well. And those seasons, we've learned up to this point, this is our sixth week in this, that these seasons are training ground for us. It's a, it's a, it's a train, it's God is using it, listen, it's a training ground for purpose. He created us for a purpose, and He's going to train us in these different seasons in our life. Some of us don't realize that we're in a season right now for a reason. There are people in your life for a season, right? We need to be able to adapt to that and recognize that, hey, them people in your life for a reason right now. They may not be there forever, but they're doing something. Something's going on. God is a big God like that. So what is he doing in seasons? And I know I've been giving this and writing these down. But he's, he's, doing, he's either teaching us. He's either challenging us. He's either encouraging us. He's either maturing us, protecting us, correcting us, directing us. We can just keep adding to this thing. That's what's going on in your season. You may be right now. You don't, you don't realize it, but you are just like your vehicle. You're up in the shop. The tires are off, and God is checking your brakes. 
And some of us, he's replacing the brakes. He says that we are his workmanship. We are what God is working on in the shop. And he does this in seasons. Okay? Now, here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about timing in our seasons. Because timing is everything. Timing in our seasons is everything. Let me, let me say this, and I want you to get this. I want you to really, I'm going to say it twice so you really get it. Timing has, has as much to do with purpose as, as purpose itself. Okay? Say that, let me say that again. Timing ha- has as much to do with your purpose. Why you were created, it, it, you were created for many different purposes, but you have a God, God-given purpose on your life. The timing is just as important to your purpose as purpose itself. Timing is everything. Let me just give you some, let me just work, we'll just work our way into this. Let me give you some practical things. So our vehicles are, believe it or not, have to be in time for, their to run, for them to run. I got my four-wheel drive dually out here. It's, with a, it's a one ton, and, and I have to have that great big old truck because I haul around about 20,000 pounds every day. So you, I need that big truck. I need, it's purpose. The reason I bought that thing, its purpose is to haul that heavy stuff around, right? But if that truck is not in time, now when I say in time, the combustion and the, the firing, all that's got to be, it's got to be in time or it's not going to work right. If my truck was in, wasn't in time, I couldn't get out there and crank it up. I couldn't get out there and haul around the heavy stuff. I got to haul around. If it ain't in time, it would be spitting and sputtering and maybe not even crank. So how would that truck fulfill its purpose if it wasn't in time? Does that make sense? All of our, all of our, most of our vehicles either have, unless you got one of them electric deals, has has a timing belt or a timing chain. Why is it there? That belt is to hold your vehicle and your rig in time. That chain is there. You break that timing chain, you break that timing belt, you ain't going nowhere, Jack, because the timing ain't right. And when time is not right, the purpose is not going to be fulfilled. I hope this is making sense. It's very important, very important. I think about me. God, <laughs> way back when, he created me to be a, a, a preacher, right? But, but, but it wasn't at seven years old, and it really wasn't even at 27 years old. If you seen what I was doing at 27, you say, no, this guy ain't going to be a preacher for sure. But it's amazing how those years, you know, and, and, until I was 39, 39 is when I stepped into what God's called me to do. But here's the deal. All those years... Grandparents were pouring into me. Friends and people that, 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 that I come across, godly people were pouring into me. I didn't even realize it. They were tilling the ground. My in-laws, man, they just pour into me. And, and then finally you step into purpose. And it's the same thing in your life as well. Timing is everything. Let's look at this. Did you go to Galatians 4? Look at the first two. Uh, did they even give you that one? I'm sorry. I hadn't slept in a week, so I don't know where I'm at. Are we in Gladewater? No. <laughs> now, watch this. this. This may not be a, like a normal verse that, you, that, that jumps out to you. Oh, like I know that. But let me explain it to you. Galatians 4, verse 1 and 2. We'll go to John 7 after that. That's where I told you to go. When you get there, say amen. amen. Okay. So listen at it. It says, it says, Now, it's talking practical here. Now, I say that the heir, the heir, okay, there's an inheritance, and that thing's going to be passed down to somebody, right? Okay, I say that the heir, as long as he is a what? A child does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. In other words, this child, when the time is right, will be master of all, will step into inheritance. Make sense? Okay, look at verse 2. But it but is, while it's a child, while it's growing, under what? Guardians and stewards until the, help me church, time appointed by the Father. Now that's a, that's a practical situation. You could look at it as a, as, a, as, a, as a boy taking over his father's business. You know, while he's a child, no, you can't handle this. But there's going to be a time you can. But until that time is, I'm going to pour into you. People are going to pour into you. It says stewards. A steward is usually a good steward, a good manager. They've been managing that thing before they pass the baton to you. 
So think about it in your life. Look at the big picture. God has called us to bring Him glory. He has called us to share Jesus Christ wherever we go, whatever platform we have. But sometimes, when we're young, we may not understand that. We may not have to do that. But we pour into people's lives so we will realize when it gets their time, they're going to do what they're created to do. So you see, see how the progression, progression goes? Again, everything that God creates is for a reason. Just because you have a purpose on something, or you have an inheritance, or you have a vision, or you have a goal, doesn't mean you're ready for it. Think about it. Think about it. Doesn't mean you're ready for it. How many times have they called up some kids from the minor leagues and they ain't ready? They got all beat around in the major leagues and tucked their tail and ran. You know? Talking about baseball. If anybody want to know what I'm talking about. Now, let's go to John 7 because I want to use Jesus here as this great example to bring this thing home. And guys, the whole reason for this is to understand that you may be walking in a season right now that you don't understand. It could be tough on you. It could be hard on you right now. It's because God is working on you to get you ready for a purpose. Or listen to me. He may be getting ready for you to help somebody else out. You may be going through what you're going through because you, that same thing you're going to need to help out somebody else with. And God's going to use you. Isn't that awesome? So let me set this up with Jesus. Now, I hope you realize that God always knew exactly when he was going to send his son. Always. In the fullness of the time, I believe it's in Galatians 4. In the fullness of the time, he sent Jesus. He knew when he was going to send Jesus. And he knows when he's going to send him back. Okay? He always knew. He knew when he was going to send Jesus to set the captive free. He knew when he was going to send Jesus to bring freedom. He knew when he was going to send Jesus to bring grace and mercy and salvation to this world. Hallelujah. Okay? Here's the thing. He also knew the specific time, the specific place that he would be born, the specific uh, around what, where he was going to be raised up, where he was going to be taught. Okay? He even knew the first ones that, that, that Jesus would be announced to that the Messiah is here. Okay? So you think about it. Born of a virgin. All right? That's God's perfect will right there. All, he got, Jesus had to be man or he couldn't walk this earth. If, he, if, if, he, if, if they didn't wrap him in flesh, we would all die. Okay? <laughs> if Jesus was turned inside out, we would all fall down because he can't, can't contain his glory. He's, he was fully man, fully God, born of a virgin, Father God, impregnated Mary. Okay? Then, where was he born? He was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. If you read about Bethlehem, it says it's the smallest of 10,000. The smallest of 10,000. That's a tiny place. Very tiny place. We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is born in the smallest of 10,000 places. Right? And then it talks about how he was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth. When people heard of Nazareth, they were Nazareth. Ain't that that little old place over there? There's like 12 families live there. All right? And, 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 and it was, it was kind of down in a valley. Like if you didn't know where Nazareth was, you, you'd be like, what is that place? You know, it wasn't like it was something known. and everybody. So this is, this is where the king of kings was born. This is where he grew up. And guess who the first ones it was that found out that Jesus the Messiah was here? It was lowly old shepherd. That's right. Shepherds were rejects. Shepherds were outcasts. So when, 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 it was just amazing that, that of all people, Jesus, the angels would come to those shepherds and say, The Messiah is here. Come see. Come see. Can you imagine when they walked up on that little, that little uh, feeding trough and they saw a little baby Jesus and they understood who he was? Because... <laughs> When angels show up, either you ain't slept and, you, and you, you don't even know what you're looking at or you've been doing something else. No, angels are there because they're representing God and we don't just see angels every day. So if angels show up and you're out there tending to sheep, being a good manager of your sheep, and then, hey, here's baby, here's baby Jesus right here. It's incredible the way God set this whole thing up. Everything was small. Think about it. The greatest and the biggest plan ever, ever, 
was done in such a small, very strategic, small way. Unknown places, unknown people. Huh, things that make you go, hmm. So why? Why would he do that? Well, I believe one reason that he does that, church, listen to me, don't, don't miss me here. It's because when, when let me just say it like this, our history does not define our, our, where we came from, like our, our purpose. Does that make sense? It, okay, our history doesn't define our destiny. Our, our, our purpose is here, but where you came from doesn't matter. Let me say that again. Your purpose is what God's called you to do, but it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your small beginnings. Listen, it doesn't matter who did raise you or who didn't raise you. Okay? God still works that thing the way he wants it. And I truly believe that. If Jesus would have came to some high up, you know, royal lady and king family and Best of the best. How would you ever think he would relate to the lowliest of lows? You can relate to the lowliest of lows because he was the lowliest of lows. He come from a little old town, you know, smallest of 10,000, born in a stable, in a, in a manger. And then he grew up where, where there were about 12 families around as a carpenter, following his earthly daddy. So, with all this said... Let's watch what, he, watch what we got here. John 7, verse 1. So it says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews wanted to kill him. They've been hearing some things that he's doing. Now the Jews, feast of the tabernacles was a hand. Now this is, this is a lot of people, right? His brothers, though, said to him, Depart from here, in other words, depart from Galilee, Go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Watch this. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. So watch their statement next. If, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5 says, for even his brothers did not believe him. So here's Jesus. He's still in Galilee. And there's this big feast going on in Judea. Everybody's there. And his brothers, his fellow Jews, start clowning him. Start criticizing him. Hey, Jesus, you know, won't you go over there? Why are you hanging around these, 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 these stanky guys, you know? Why, why are you letting these little kids follow you around? Them kids will follow anybody. You know, this, this, is, this is basically what they're, what they're saying. He, he, what, are you scared to go over there to the big crowds? Now, this is Jesus we're talking about, right? They didn't believe him. They didn't believe what he was doing. They, they were just critical. Anybody like this uh, critical? You know anybody critical like this in your life? Quit preaching to these small crowds, Jesus. If you want to do anything, go to the big city. Well, if you notice, when Jesus did everything, when he first started, everything was in secret. Everything was small. Remember his first miracle? He's at the wedding with his mama, and they ran out of wine, and you don't run out of wine back in them days. They, they'll, they'll kick you out. But his mom, being friends with the wedding party, says, Jesus, do something. Jesus, do something. And, and do y'all remember what he said to her? Woman, my time hasn't come yet. Mama, it ain't my time. It's not my time, right? But he's compassionate because that's what Jesus does. So he finally tells his disciples to take those empty water pots that they've been washing their feet in and go and fill it up with water. And what happened? It was the best of the best wine there was. But Jesus never touched a pot, and he never touched the wine, never touched the water, not one time. His disciples did the whole thing. And if you look at that miracle, there's not a whole lot of people would know. Remember the, 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 the headmaster of the party, when he hit it, he's like, man, y'all, y'all saved the best for last. Jesus never said a word. There was only just a few knew what he did when he turned water into wine. 
But here we are, here in, 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 in John 7, where his brothers are clowning him and mocking him for doing things small. I can see them, if that, if that was today, they'd ask Jesus, how come you ain't on Facebook? Hey, how come you ain't got your Facebook page, you know? How come you ain't TikToking? <laughs> Jesus, you need to be TikToking, man. You need to be on Insta, Insta chat or whatever it is, you know? Throw it out there. Come on, Jesus, get you a YouTube channel. That's what they're saying. Let's see if you be trending, Jesus. <laughs> Is Jesus, is Jesus trending today? <laughs> yeah, he absolutely is. Here's what's cool, and, and, and this is what I want us to learn in this, because there's going to be people in our life clowning us in our seasons. Okay? They're going to be, just like they did Jesus, they're going to be clowning us in our season, especially if you share what you think your purpose God's calling you to be. Then they're really going to clown you. Ask Joseph. The moment he told his brothers that he had a dream they were going to bow down to him, they throwed him in the pit. <laughs> if, he, if he wouldn't have told them his vision, they probably, he probably wouldn't have got thrown in the pit, though. <laughs> but here's the thing. None of this bothered Jesus because he knew the script that his father had written for him. He knew his purpose. He knew what his life was going to do. Listen, he knew what his season was. These people didn't. So he just took it. None of that bothered him. They clowned him all. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say clowning, right? That's what we say in Arkansas. I'm sorry, messing with you, criticizing you, clowning you. You know what I'm saying. So what are you saying, Brother Scotty? Listen to me. There are people in your life who are going to be critical of you, and they don't even know what God's script is for you. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say. We, we got to take that stuff and, 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 and let it roll off like a duck's back. We don't have to listen to those people because all they are, they're there for the enemy. The enemy knows where you're headed because he knows there's Jesus is, is over your life. And he's going to send people in your life to discourage you from your purpose to mess up the whole script that God has wrote for you. Listen, you may not be doing what, what, what you're going to do yet because the timing is not right yet. I'm telling you, I, I think back in school, man, I had people clown me. Oh, Scotty, you, 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 you play football, you play basketball, but why are you sitting on the bench? You know, early on, I sat on the bench, man. I rode the bench for years, especially in football. I had a dude, I was a wide receiver, and I had a guy in front of me. He, he, he was about that big. Who, who are they going to throw the ball to, dude this big or me, right? And I, and I was real, I was skinny, like I turned this, skinny back then, I turned this way, you, you, you'd miss me. But they climb, my friends would climb, well, we come to watch you, we come to the game, and you, you never got in the game, you, you, why was you sitting on the bench? Or we come to the basketball game, why are you sitting on the bench? And here's what they, re, they didn't realize, it, it wasn't my time yet, there were, there were other people in, in, in front of me. Here's the deal, I still needed to grow in knowledge, and I needed to put some muscle on if I was going to be playing like I should. But when I was on the sidelines and when I was on the bench, I was in learn mode, learn mode. I was soaking it up. I promise you I was much in the game as the people in the game was in the game. Yeah. But guess what? When it came my time, I was the one scoring some touchdowns, right? I love that. I love being in that. I was the one uh, 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 hitting the shots and shooting the threes. It was, it was finally my time. Your preacher put up 64 in one game one time. Hey, <laughs> I'm bragging on myself, ain't I? You need to be humble, five. But here's what I'm just talking about. Here, here's what I would do. I would hit a shot, and then those that would clown me be sitting in the stands or, or, or sitting on the bench, and I'd run by the bench and say, well, why not you get out of here? I'll get you, give you some of that, you know. I was clowning them then, which I shouldn't have be done that. <laughs> but here's what I'm saying. We don't need to take that criticism and that clown in the heart because it just may not be your time yet. I hope that makes sense. Don't listen to that mess. Timing is so important. Okay, when it's, when, it's, when it's not our time, we need to be like I was talking about, being on the bench and you're soaking it all up. You're waiting well. We've been talking about it, three or four weeks. We need to wait well. You wait well. When you, if you wait wrong, you wait long, right? You wait well. You prepare. You soak it up while, until it's your time. Because listen to me let, me, let me lay this on you. Here's the truth. The truth is this. If you were to step in 
to your purpose and it wasn't in time, you wouldn't be recognized. They wouldn't even recognize you. What are you talking about? Let's just, just, let me just say it like this. Say you go to the restaurant today after church. And you go in the restaurant and you, you got your kids with you, grandkids or whoever. And you notice when you walk in, there's a table here that has EMT paramedics at this table. And you just notice because you see the shirts on, the white shirts with the stuff on. You know, they, you saw the ambulance out front, you know. Yeah, there they are, you know, whatever. Hey, thank y'all, appreciate y'all. And you go on by, right? You go over there and sit at the table. You're about midway through your meal and one of your, your children starts choking. Choking, can't breathe. You reach over there, you hit on the back, and ain't nothing happening. They turn in, they turn in different colors. Where, were your, where would your attention turn to then? To the EMTs and the paramedics. Your, our cries would go out to them. Somebody we didn't even think about. We may not even acknowledge them. We just saw it and kind of remembered it in the back of our mind. We walked right by them. But when we need them, all of our attention, all of our cries turn to them. What, what just changed? What just changed in that whole situation? Well, the time had come. <laughs> the time had come when you needed them and you needed their training and you needed their knowledge and you needed their wisdom to come over here and clear the windpipe of your child. You see what I'm saying? When it's, the time is not right, you, you, you may not be recognized. But when it's time, it's time to step up because, because then you're needed. There's a reason for it. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, that God himself, it says, it says this, it says a man will plan his own way, a man will plan his own way, but God directs his steps. Please don't miss that. Yes, we can plan, 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 plan all day long, all week long, all year long. Who knows that, that, that <laughs> our plans are just a suggestion. But it says God directs our steps. The Lord directs our steps. Listen, God will have you step into a person's life at the perfect time. And God will have, have somebody step into your life at the perfect time. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? And here's the deal. But the prep for you stepping into somebody's life or them stepping into yours life has been going on for a long time before then. The seasons have been preparing them for that. So, here in John 7, you, they're clowning Jesus, right? And watch his response in verse 6. He says to them, my time hadn't come yet. That's exactly what he told his mama, didn't he? He said, guys, my time, I'm not going to go to Judea right now because my time hadn't come. So here's what I'm saying, church. If Jesus respected seasons and times, we need to do the same. Timing has just as much as importance to purpose as purpose does. Now, fast forward to, to chapter 12. All right, John chapter 7, he said his time hadn't come. Even though he'd been doing some things, his time hadn't come. Do you want to see his time come? Go to, go to John 12. Let's look at verse 18. Now, before I read this, I want you to understand, in John 7, he said my time hadn't come yet, right? Well, in John 12, <laughs> there's a lot has happened in five chapters if, if you go back and read it, all right? Jesus has been, been, been doing, you know, his time has come, right? He's been doing a lot of things. But then he had just raised Lazarus from the dead, okay? Think about it. He just raised a man from the dead. What do you think? The and see, that, you may think that's not a big deal, but you think about it if you were there in this day. We don't think it's a big deal because we've been raised from the dead. Right? Okay. Spiritually, right? Right? We, we know what Jesus can do. We've been reading it for years. We see what Jesus can do. But don't ever let the good news become old news. Okay? So watch what happened, man. Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 18. For this reason, the people also met Jesus, him. Because they heard that he had done this sign, raised Lazarus from the dead. Watch the Pharisees. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you know, they, they hate Jesus, right? They, they don't want to see this. They don't believe that he's a Messiah. He says, you see that, that, that you are accomplishing nothing. That's what they're talking about to each other. We, we, it's, in other words, our, our attacks on him, us clowning him, are doing no good. 
Look, the world has gone after him. Wait a minute. Five chapters earlier, they were clowning him because he, he, he wouldn't get on Facebook. But now they're saying the world is going after him. Come on, somebody. And we're still going after him today. Watch verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast as well. Greeks are not even Jews. They don't even believe like the Jews do. But they've been heard that Jesus raised a man from the dead. They got to come see what in the world is going on. Watch what they say in verse 21. When the Greeks get there and they come to the feast, they, they, they hear about the feast and they, they want to be there, they want to figure out what's going on. Watch what they say in verse 21. They came to Philip, who was in Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, they asked him, Philip, we wish to see Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Greeks, people don't believe, like, for the one true God have made their way to this area and they walk up to Philip and they say, Sir, we want to see Jesus. I don't care about what y'all got going on out here and why y'all staying in tents and why y'all singing Kumbaya and all that. I want to see, we want to see Jesus. We heard that he raised a man from the dead. We want to see Jesus. <clears throat> Church, that right there is my prayer, that people would see Jesus. Jesus in our lives outside this door they would see the peace and the joy and the hope they, they would see that we're different they would see that we're light that, that we're salt where we preserve and they would see all of this and they would they would like man I want me some of that I want me some of that and so when they come to you they're not wanting you they want to see Jesus take me to your leader <laughs> right Amen. They want to see Jesus in us. So, so, so with that note, with saying that, how well are you representing Jesus? How well are you representing? Has anybody come to you and, 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 and asked to see Jesus yet? H or lately? H has that happened? Because, because if it hasn't, maybe you're not representing him like you should be. Because when, when we get to looking too much like the world then we just blend in with everybody else. But when you become a light, then you shine in the dark, things come to you. And then you point them to Jesus. That's the way it works. So watch Jesus' response in verse 22 to all this. He says, the hour has come. It's time that the Son of Man should be glorified. I love that. The hour has come. That the Son of Man may be glorified. In other words, it's his time. It's his time. Now, what time is he talking about, church? He's talking about going to the cross for us. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about the atonement, his blood being poured out to pay our sin debt. My goodness, his time has come. But five chapters early, he wasn't saying that. The timing is right. The one that makes a, 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 a garden out of a grave... It's time. It's time. Now, let's go back. I want, I want to look at this a little closer leading up to this. Go back to chapter 11. Let's look at his timing. Let's talk about timing a little more. Y'all getting anything out of this? Okay. John chapter 11, look at verse 1. Let's just, let's just watch, watch this, how, how, that, how all this went down. So there was a certain man, he was sick. That was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who had anointed Jesus. Remember, she wiped her hair with the oil on it in his feet. Uh, therefore, verse 3, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love, in other words, Lazarus is sick. Verse 4, Jesus heard that. He says, he tells his disciples that this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. If Jesus says that, it's just like when he says to his disciples, we're going to the other side of the lake. If he says we're going to the other side of the lake, you might as well lay down and take a nap too. 
Because Jesus, his, he's going to have what he says, always. Okay, so when he says, hey, Lazarus, this does not lead unto death, even though he may drop dead, you can expect Jesus is going to have what he says. He's going to get up at some point. Cause why? Because he said it, right? And Jesus is going to always have what he said. And then he was going to be glorified. God would be glorified out of the whole situation. If, if, if they would have just heard that and had faith enough to trust in that, then there would have been all this other problem. <laughs> Verse 5, Jesus loved Mar Martha and, and, and Mary and, and, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, watch this, because God does things strategically, right? It said he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Boy, that's a good friend, isn't it? Jesus, you're the resurrection and the life. Your buddy's sick, somebody you love, but you're going to stay there a couple more days. Now, that doesn't make sense to us. You would think he would hurry and be on the scene but that wasn't his plan. That wasn't his plan. Because if he'd have done that, it wouldn't have went down like what I'm going to show you here. Okay? Jesus stayed a couple of more days on purpose. Jesus wanted to show up four days after Lazarus has died. And I always wondered about this four-day thing, and I've always thought about this four-day, and I come across this old tale, this old uh, belief that they had early in, in, in the years before before a coroner. You know, you, what you normally do, you have an EMT or a paramedic say that you, either you passed, but it takes the coroner to come and say, yes, they are not, they're, they're dead, okay? But they didn't have that back then. So what they would do, they'd check for a heartbeat and, 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 and see and say, well, he, he, he might be dead, okay? But we're not sure. That's why they would bury people and they would put that string and had that hole going in a coffin. And you, you, if you wake up in the coffin and you see a string hanging in front of you, you better start pulling that thing. Ding, ding, because it's hooked to a bell on the outside. Where somebody, I'm still alive down here. Ding, 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 right? Does that make sense? I mean, that, I mean you think about it. There had to be some way to let them know that, hey, I'm not dead. Because evidently there, there have been some people, and, and you, can look, you can look this stuff up. There's people who they thought was dead, and, and, and they'd be ringing that bell in the casket. They weren't dead. They may have been in a coma. You know what I'm saying. So here's what they believed, and, and, you, and you can go look at this and find this. They believed that a man's spirit would hover over him for three days after he died. But on four days he was dead. That's just what they believed, and that ain't the truth. Okay? If a man was to be die and then get back up, you know, I don't know. He was in a coma. They just couldn't feel the heartbeat. But he was still alive. You're still alive when you're in a coma, right? Anyway, I ain't a doctor, but you know what I'm talking about. I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express one time. <laughs> Y'all ain't right. So why, why four days? Why four days? Well, because if he would have gotten there on day three, his naysayers, his ones that's clowning him, would have said, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, oh, he wasn't really dead. Make sense? He, 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 he wasn't dead. He, he really wasn't dead. I told y'all he really wasn't dead, even though he was stinking. <laughs> he ain't dead, right? Oh, yeah, he was dead. But that's why I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm pretty sure that's why Jesus waited till the last four days. Now, let me really mess you up right here. You know, our Easter scene, we think that Jesus died, uh, died on Friday, beaten and died on Friday, and he got up Sunday morning. And, you know, that's pretty and that's cute and everything, but that's not what the Scripture says, Okay? you got to think about it. And, 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 and I'm sorry if I'm messing anything up for you here, but I just want to make sure you get the truth. Let me put this on the screen. Matthew 12, verse 40. Jesus says this. He says, For as Jonah was three days... Remember, remember Jonah got it, uh, eaten by the great fish? As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, three days and three nights, what does it say? So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights... In the heart of the earth. Okay? So, so that messes up the Friday-Sunday thing. Okay? It would have been more like Monday if you were starting on Friday. 
all right? Is it possible that the same thing here, if Jesus would have got up on, on day one or day two, they'd have said, oh, he wasn't really dead, you know? So it's possible this is why three days and four days and, and, and all that. In other words, listen, the world would say, <laughs> it ain't dead yet. It ain't dead yet. And listen, there may be some things that we're going through in some seasons in our life right now. God really hadn't showed up and showed out because it ain't dead enough. Because <laughs> you think that's what Jesus is doing. He wants to make sure Lazarus is good and dead before he raises him from the dead. Right? And he's going to get the glory. So why, why, when, is, when is God going to deliver America? Well, it ain't dead enough yet. <laughs> No, I didn't say that. Anyway, I'm just messing with y'all. So, so let's skip ahead. Let's skip ahead. Look at verse 21 in John chapter 11. So Jesus headed, heads that way, right? So he rolls up to Martha. And she said in verse 21, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would have not died. But even though, watch her, she, then she tries to spiritualize it. But even, even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said back to him, oh, I know he will. He'll rise, uh, rise in, a, in, a, in a resurrection on the last day. She knew, she, knew, she knew the truth. But Jesus says, hey, <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though they may die, shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Come right back on her. <laughs> he, church, he, he's the one that raises dead things. Right? Jump to verse 38. So we pick it up right here. Jesus comes up to the tomb and he's groaning. And, he, and there was a stone against it. He told the guys to, to take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was, who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time, he, he's going, he's, there's a stench. He stinks. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and says, Father, I thank you that you hear me, and you've heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of these people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, yes, sir, he did. And he who had died came out bound hand, foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus says, y'all go cut him loose. Let him go. Verse 45 says, And many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen these things that Jesus did, they believed in him. This would be the group that was saying earlier, Jesus, why don't you go down there and quit being scared of the crowd? Why don't you get your Facebook page? Why don't you start TikToking? These are the same guys. And now they're sitting there amazed at what God can do. Amen. Guys, you do realize that Lazarus is a picture of us. It's who we were before Jesus. But when Jesus showed up and he says, Scotty, come forth. I had to come up and rise up out of there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I had to rise up out of that dead life because that was leading me nowhere. 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 See, up, up to this point, those that were, had been clowning him, they were dis pretty much could try to discount his miracles. Oh, he, that was food coloring, you know, in the, in the wine. Or the guy that was blind, remember they had to go ask his mom and daddy, was he really blind? Was he really blind? Yeah, he was really blind. And then what about the demoniac? I guess they could say, say that he wasn't crazy enough, you know. There's always somebody somebody's going to try to discount something no matter what it is and what it looks like. But here's what I love about Jesus. You cannot deny when somebody's been dead four days and they walk up out of the tomb with the grave clothes on. You can't deny that. And that's why Jesus was sit here for the time as it this. And the timing was 
perfect. Now, let me show you how the enemy works, and we'll wind this thing down. Look, John 12, look at verse 9. Now, watch how the enemy gets into all this. And believe me, if he tries to get in this in Jesus' season, he's going to try to get in mine and yours as well. John 12, look at verse 9. So this is after all of this. So a great many Jews knew that, that Jesus was there, and they came, not for Jesus, though, only, but they wanted to come see Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. I imagine, let's go see the dead man, and let's see the man that raised him from the dead. But watch this. We read this a few weeks back. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. <laughs> That always cracks me up. Jesus just raised him from the dead, and now they want to kill him again. Doesn't make any sense to me. But doesn't that sound like the enemy? Look at verse 11. Because on account of, of him, because account of Lazarus, on the account of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. You hear that? So they're ticked at Lazarus for getting up out of the grave. <laughs> okay? And because he got up out of the grave... Many people were coming to Jesus. So they hate Jesus, right? Jesus is the core of who they hate. But now Lazarus is preaching Jesus and saying, Hey, Jesus raised me from the dead. Now they want to kill him. They can't kill Jesus. Now they're trying to kill Lazarus. It's just crazy. Doesn't that sound like the enemy? Yeah. Okay, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. If we're, if we're a type of Lazarus, now you know why the devil hates you. Now you know why the devil's trying to take you out. Because he hates you. Because he sees, here's the thing, people are seeing. Listen, I hope they're seeing this. People are seeing, seeing the effects in your life because Jesus rose you from the dead. Here's the thing, Jesus rose you from the dead and you can't shut up about it. You've been telling people at work. You've been telling people down at the ball field. You've been telling people down at Walmart. You've been telling people while you're bu pumping gas. And the enemy hates it. You've been telling your kids. You've been telling your grandkids all about Jesus and how Jesus brought you from death to life, from being in the grave to a garden, and you can't stop telling it. And the devil hates that. So that's why the world hates you. That's why the world is trying to kill you. Because of Jesus. And it's always going to be like that. Think about it. The enemy hates us. That's why he's trying to silence the church. Because he knows that our testimony can change the world. You do realize that, right? Your testimony can change the world, my friend. Your testimony. Well, Brother Scotty, uh, I didn't come from much. My parents really didn't even raise me. One of them tried. Who do you sound like? Jesus! Jesus! You can't play that card. He wants to use you. Oh my goodness, church, listen to me right now. Any platform, any influence that you have right now or you will have later, you have to use it to tell people about your Jesus. Because that's why you will be on that platform. That's why you will have that influence. Yeah, you may be teaching this or doing that, but there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger purpose. There's been seasons preparing you for this time in your life. And that platform is being used to set you up, to get up a little bit higher, to spread that light of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. So listen, I'm not kidding you. I don't know if you're going to be singing. I don't know if you're going to be teaching. I don't know if you're going to be a, a, a doctor, a lawyer, EMT, whatever. I don't know. Whatever it is, that is a platform. That is a type of platform that people will respect you because you're in that platform. And when you're in that platform, you have a better view, eye view, and a better place to share Jesus. Why? Because people will respect you because of the platform that you have or the influence that you have. And you got to do it, man. God's purpose and timing, use it for his glory because you got to realize you are there at that moment for a time as this. Remember Esther? <laughs> she was there for a time as this. 
Use it for his glory. You do realize that he created you for his glory. Well, I'll let me close. I'll close right here. Okay, so Jesus, Jesus' first recorded words was at 12 years old. His mom and daddy, how do you lose a son of God? That's what I want to know. <laughs> his mom and daddy lost him. Like, left him in town for a few days. Like, like they, they, got, they got heading back on the deal and like got to looking around. Where, where, where's Jesus? <laughs> I don't know. I thought you got him. No, I thought you got him. How do you lose the son of God? <laughs> the king of the world. <laughs> anyway, so they go all the way back. They go back where they were, and they start looking for Jesus, looking for Jesus. Look at, he wasn't out on the playground. Okay, he's 12 years old. He wasn't out on the playground. He wasn't down at the creek. You know, he wasn't out on the ball field. Where, where did they find Jesus? He was in the church house. He was in the church house. And when they got him, they kind of, they say, Jesus, where you been? Come here, get over here. What are you doing in here? He said, there's one thing. One thing. Look at it on the screen. Luke 2, verse, verse, uh, verse 49. He says, why are you looking for me? He says, don't you know I'm about my father's business? Why are you looking for me? I've got a call on my life. I've got a purpose on my life. If you're looking for me, I ain't going to be on the swing set. I'm not going to be on the slide. I'm, on, I'm not going to be down there at the creek. I am about my father's business. He says, that's why I was up in the church house straightening these Pharisees out. Because <laughs> he's like, they got it wrong. They got it wrong. They thinking it's what they can do when they don't know I came to bring mercy and grace. I brought, God came out of heaven. We can't get to him. We, he came to us. And the only way to the Father is through Jesus. So, first record, recorded words was about purpose. First recorded words was about purpose. I'm about my daddy's business. What are you going to do if somebody asks you tomorrow? What are you doing? What are you doing? Just tell them, I'm about my father's business. Unless you're doing something crazy. That's, that's one way to gauge your life. You, can, you, can you gauge your life by saying, Here's, this is good. Gauge your life. What you're sitting and doing, is it about the Father's business? Oh, that's a tough one right there. Okay, so that's his first words at 12 years old. What was his last words at 33? It is finished. That's exactly right. It is finished. John 19, 30. He, he says, to tell us die, to tell us die. To tell us die means, you know, when they, would, when they would win a battle, they would holler back, to tell us die. And the next guy would hear it. He would holler, to tell us die. And they would pass it on. Die. In other words, it is finished. The battle is won. They would even do it like when somebody paid a debt, they would say, to tell us die. It's paid off. Jesus' last words was it is finished. The time came. He walked the walk. He talked the talk. He did the did, right? He did it all. He finished it. He paid our sin debt. And then he got up out the grave. Amen. First words, I'm about my daddy's business. His purpose. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm going to do. His last word, daddy, I finished it. I did it. It was rough. It was very, very, very hard. But I did it. Isn't that beautiful? But there's something there we got to see. Twelve years old, he knew his purpose. But he didn't, he didn't walk in the purpose till 30. Okay, think about it. Timing, right? Timing. Twelve, twelve, he knew his purpose. He probably knew it for then, right? But twelve, we'll just say twelve. And, and in 30, boom, he started walking in purpose. That means for 18 years, if I'm doing the math right, for 18 years... He knew his purpose for 18 years. And he was still okay and content with just being a carpenter. Because he knew that he was being trained, matured, taught, encouraged, challenged, protected, directed, corrected, whatever he needed to when he turned 30, to stand up in that church house when he read the scroll of Isaiah and says, I'm here to set the captive free. He was being trained all of that time for 18 years. So listen, in three years, from 30 to 33, Jesus Christ became the centerpiece of the world. And he still is. Listen to me. That's why I don't want you to get discouraged. I don't want you to get discouraged. Okay? Three years of ministry. Listen to me. 
Three years of ministry was prepared by 18 years of seasons and waiting and preparing and maturing. You get that? Three years of ministry happened because of 18 years of preparation and seasons in his life. That's why he had to tell his mama, it ain't my time yet. That's why he had to tell his brothers, it ain't time yet. But when it was time, he showed up. He showed up. So I want to ask you today, what is God doing in your seasons? See, you're going through this right now, and it's preparing you for whatever that purpose is. You don't want to go into purpose half-cocked. You don't want to go into purpose at the right, wrong time. You want to follow God's will for your life. So here's what I'm saying. Quit whining and complaining in this season right now. Let him work on you. Let him change your diaper and get the mess out of your life. Okay? If you would, bow your heads. So what do you need to add to your life right now that would say that you're about the Father's business? Better yet, what do you need to subtract from your life right now so people will know that you're about the Father's business? Because here's the truth, church. You're going to come across the path of people that need you. They're going to need you more than ever. And it's not really you that they're needing. They're needing Jesus in you. And we've been put here to be Jesus to the world. But I don't know about you. But I would not want to step into somebody's life and misrepresent Jesus. I would not want to misrepresent the Father's business. So as painful as it is right now, soak up the encouragement, soak up the trials, soak up getting your brakes changed. God wants to set your timing so you're not spitting and sputtering. Some of you may be wore out right now. Some of you may be spitting and sputtering right now because the timing's off. You're trying to do too much. Listen, think about what you do have and don't worry about what you don't have and teach you to number your days and enjoy what you have, man. Enjoy what God's doing in your life. Take a step back. Quit getting in such a hurry. Because people are going to need you. Those kids you're raising are going to need you more than ever. Are you positioned to raise them the right way, the way God is wanting you to raise them? You talk about a purpose. For God to take one of his children and allow you and allow us to manage their life, and to be an earthly mother and father for them. Can you imagine the responsibility? But listen, if you're all messed up and you're all going this way, that way, too busy, worried about the wrong thing, how, how are you going to be what God wants you to be for that child? Listen, calm down. Calm down. He says, be still and know that I am God. And take that heavy weight that you brought. Lay it at his feet. He specializes in it. 
Come to me, all who are weary, heavy laden. I'll give you rest is what he says to us. Oh, he says, take my yoke. Learn from me. Can't do it when you going every which way, though. Let the, word, let, the, let the Lord have His work in your life, my friend. If you've gotten away from Him and you've gotten down the, the wrong road and you've been worried more about what the world is saying, you've been worried more about what people are saying on your Facebook, but worried more about you know, the criticism that you're getting, listen, you're worried about the wrong thing. None of that bothered Jesus because He knew what God is doing in His life. All that is is a plot to stop you in your season. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Come back to Him. Father, I thank You for this Word today. I thank You for giving strength where there's weakness. I thank You for loving, loving us enough to invest in us, to give us a purpose, to love us enough to call us your workmanship, your masterpiece. Wow. Lord, I pray there's some soul searching goes on today. I pray we come back to you. I pray we take a deep breath and realize that you are in control. And if you started to work in it, so you're going to finish the thing. You don't start something and not finish it. You're the great finisher. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving breath in our lungs. We love you, Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Everybody says amen. If you would stand. I want to throw a challenge out to you during this time. During this last song. And don't let this freak you out. But I want you to go pray with somebody. And you may be here, you may not know anybody, whatever. You may just be with your group. Yeah, yeah, that's fine too. But don't be shocked if somebody comes to pray with you. But I want you to pray with somebody. I want, if you're here with your kids, I want you to just put your arms around them. And I want you to tell them how much you love them and how much the Lord loves them. Speak blessing into their life. If you're with your spouse, man. Speak blessing over one another. Pray for one another. You're the church. What does that mean? It means you've been built on the rock of Jesus Christ. You're more than a conqueror. You're a prayer warrior whether you know it or not. And no, there's no perfect words. You just talk to him. You can talk to other people. Can you talk to Jesus? Because he loves talking to you. Can you imagine what it would do someone, for someone if you put your hand on their shoulder and asked them to pray with them today? So we'll just say, Lord, have your way for the rest of this song or, or, or however long. And just let the Lord lead you. Amen.